welcome Dr. Nick Weaver from ICSI slash uh, Berkeley. So uh, Nick, his research interests are eclectic. <laughs> um, his dissertation was on FPGAs. Um, he's got some very nice papers on doing uh, hardware accelerated intrusion detection systems. Um, he's known for his work on worms and malcode, including postulating the first of very fast, less than 15 minute internet worm. Those of you who are in my Networking class may remember the um, Warhol worm and the how to own the internet in your spare time. That's this guy. Um, and he's one of the primary developers of the Netalyzer network diagnostic tool, which um, has been getting a lot of media attention. And I think I also assigned in one of my other networking classes. So that's also this guy. And he's going to tell us some um, very cool results from a large project he's been involved in. Thank you very much. Um, the title of this talk is Serendipity and Spam. Translation, what happens when a team of 15 researchers decide to read about a billion spam, give or take, slightly less. A billion sounds better. But first of all, an important acknowledgment, I am but a small piece in this very big joint project. Unless I specifically call out something as a part that I specifically did, assumed it was somebody else who's smarter than me. Um, being a big project, we of course came up with a mission patch. Um, this mission patch is full of symbolism. Measure seven times, cut thrice in Russian, because we're dealing with Russians. And we started writing the paper on at least three occasions. Um, the ma Mastodon was the name of our database server. Uh, if you don't keep all your data in a database, uh, your life hurts. Um, the two tusks are the two separate halves of the project up at Berkeley and ICSI er, and down at San Diego. The red dots are the banks we will reveal later. Any mission patch involving electronics has to have lightning bolts that just happen to spell out WWW. And because we are so successful, if you only look at the ones not intersected, it spells out WIN. And as I said, this was a 15-person collaboration. Um, and so, of course, we have to have one Viagra tablet for each person in the collaboration. Um, uh, Miha, who is the one female author on the paper. Um, and this work was sponsored by the National Science Foundation and the Office of Naval Research with a lot of uh, operational and in-kind support from a whole host of companies, plus companies that shall not be named. But any opinions are those of me. So overall, we focus a huge amount of research, both in our group and just in general, on how spam works, how botnets generate spam, great papers, how bot masters infect systems. Well, of course, these days, it's how they pay to infect systems, how the bots are controlled and you can intercept it, milking the botnets so that a paper that came out of other researchers in our group was, well, keep asking the botnet for spam because this gives you uh, a list of 100% spam, which makes your spam filters really good. Huge amount of fighting. And we spend a huge amount of money trying to fight it. But let's step back a bit. And that's what we did as a group, is spam exists to make money. After all, the legitimate spammers are quite clear to call it unsolicited commercial email. If they don't make money, there is no spam. So we focused on the largest category of commercial sales that end up in our own inboxes, Can pharmaceuticals. I, quickly, I mean, there is some spam that's solely there to do things like, you know, propagate malware and get you to click and so on and so forth. But in order to, I'm not sure it would all be gone. In, but most of that malware propagation exists to create the botnets or in the paper install that's being paid for to send more spam. Well, maybe. There's other reasons you might yeah. have The first order, this is a huge driver. There are other reasons, but it gets rid of 90% if they can't make money. So we started looking at pharmaceuticals, Viagra and company, um, replica, fake Rolexes, and other luxury goods. Um, and uh, software, the downloadable OEM software stores that are basically selling pirated Microsoft stuff. Um, there were a few things. 
in common, all of these are based on the user having to click on the spam to visit a web page to order a product. And this is a huge fraction of the spam. There are things we ignored. But also, these are all driven by what are called affiliate programs. There's a split of responsibility between the spammer and the people running the storefront and the infrastructure. The affiliate program runs the infrastructure. The spammers send the spam. And that way, the affiliate program can say, oh, no, we don't spam. We just only hire spammers. Um, we did not analyze the 419 Nigerian print scam because there are plenty of people who do that with the uh, spam bait projects. Um, those are very fun reading if you're bored. Read the 419 Eater web page. Um, we avoided pornography for rather obvious reasons of keeping the university happy. Um, and we avoided gambling related because gambling is already being attacked on the financial front already. So what do we mean by affiliate program? An affiliate program, this happens to be the one for RX promotions. And Kirill happens to be a native Russian speaker, so he was able to translate all of it. It's basically an advertisement to spammers. That, hey, spammer, spam our affiliate program. What does this get you? 60% commission. So if the sale is 100 bucks, you, the spammer, get 60 bucks. It's nice. Pay out on demand. You don't have to wait around so they can't hold your money. Because let's face it, um, honor among thieves is not all that much. You don't want to have to trust somebody you're dealing with. Low prices. So the prices of the products that your web store is presenting are cost competitive. Because, well, you don't want that cut rate uh, Indian Viagra to be overpriced because then people won't buy it. Open your own store. Gives they do all the work for you, just easy. Detailed statistics, after all, the bad guys need analytics too. And we've actually seen some bad guys use Google Analytics for this purpose. Contests, parties. Um, I believe RX Promotions is actually kind of famous for the gold brick party where the top affiliate program get, um, the top uh, spammer gets a gold brick and uh, there are some photos of some of these parties that are decidedly not safe for work. Free hosting, low cost, and rich promo materials. So basically, if you have a botnet, you go here, you send out the spam, and you make money. That's their pitch. Um, and as long as you're Russian, it seems like a great business. But what we wanted to do is, since this is now how spam works, we wanted to understand what happens after the click. So what is that monetization infrastructure that the affiliate program provides that hosts the DNS and web, that processes the payments, that ships the products? Um, because one thing that you might find surprising, stuff ships. We get stuff when we order. And along the way, we also discovered the market, how much revenue within ballpark figure, um, and what, who are the customers and what do they buy. We actually were able to see what people buy from a spamvertised online pharmacy. And it's not just Viagra. So this was a pictogram of an actual incident, an actual email into our um, system. Um, the Grum botnet, in this case, was running in the honey farm, sent this message for medicshopnerx.ru advertising low cost Viagra. So, what happens if the user actually clicks on this? Well, there's actually this huge web of infrastructure behind it. So, to start with, there's the DNS lookup. The user's computer, for the non-techies in this crowd, has to find out where medshopnorex.ru is. So they first, their system first contacts the, their, the DNS server on their behalf, contacts the registrar, which contacts the actual DNS server. So if this name goes away, the spam wouldn't work. If this DNS server went away, the spam wouldn't work because the user couldn't get to the website. So these are all necessary parts of the infrastructure. Then they 
browser ends up visiting the web page. Now that the DNS server is told the address, again, if this doesn't work, the user sees no uh, ad. And the website actually goes and contacts the affiliate program to get the actual page. And voila, the user gets this lovely thing for Pharmacy Express, um, aka Rx Promotions. Now that's all fine and good, and if any parts of this chain don't work, the uh, spam would fail. But uh, they call it Canadian Pharmacy. Every half the internet road pharmacies say they're Canadian. It's kind of tradition at this point. Um, but this still has not made the spammer or the affiliate program a dime. The user actually has to try to purchase something. So suppose the user actually tries to purchase something. Well, there's the, uh, they put a click and that starts the purchase process, which goes back to the affiliate program, which sends the credit card information to the merchant bank, in this case, the Azerbaijan Bank in Azerbaijan, which goes and through the visa system, gets the payment from the issuing bank to the merchant bank and the user to the uh, issuing bank. And then the affiliate program contacts the manufacturer in India, who then, drop ships the result back to the user. And all these chains have to work for the spammer to make money. If any one of these pieces fails, there's no money involved. They actually do ship it back? Yes, they have to. Because under the credit card rules, suppose what happens if the user never receives a product. The user calls his bank which gives the user his money bank, and this bank goes to this bank and gets its money bank, and this bank goes, give me the money back. So you have to deliver product if you actually charge the credit card as a business, or the money goes away. And also, too many chargebacks, and this guy goes, to heck with you, I'm cutting you off as a customer. So they do have to ship stuff, and they do ship stuff. And that is actually a very important part of the chain. If they don't ship, they don't sell. So we started with about a billion spams, give or take. So we had a whole bunch of spam feeds. And we extracted the URLs from them. And we got 969 million URLs, not distinct URLs. That's raw. But we got 17 million distinct domains coming from our various spam feeds. So. We have anonymous partners, which just have these honeypots that just only accept spam. So they're seeded addresses around the internet, um, as well as domains that just only accept spam. Um, there's results of human identified spam filters going, this is spam, so we see it. Um, we also, in our group, have this system called a honey farm, where we've got a whole bunch of systems that can run bots in a controlled environment and control who they talk to. And any spam generated by a bot is clean spam, so that goes into our feeds. And we reduced all of this to just the URLs. We don't care about the images or anything else because the images are secondary. What we care about is the infrastructure needed for the sale. Um, and as I said, this was almost a billion URLs. Databases are your friend. So once the URLs are extracted, then the whole crawling infrastructure begins. And so we have both the DNS crawler. Um, Niha wrote that, although it used some of my code. And the web crawler, which is doing actual full Firefox. It's not just a little Python thing, but it's actually rendering the pages. And the output literally is this, we get screenshots as well as the document objects for the final landing page. <laughs> We've looked at a lot of these things. So uh, 3.5 million domains visited, but this covered 950 million of the URL. So we basically visited almost all of the spam related URLs, at least domain based, going into the crawling. 
So the DNS crawler is aggressive, crawling multiple times to get the fast flux issue. So it'll keep asking for names until it always gets the same answer. Um, it keeps querying domains daily for a week. Um, the web crawler is instrumented Firefox in a cluster, 100 copies of Firefox per node and a pretty big cluster. And we had to use real Firefox because some of these redirections are ugly JavaScript. Um, and we wanted it to actually act like a real web browser because some of the things don't render if uh, you don't have the right user agent, as well as just they don't render. So we needed it to render. And then after the page loaded for a little bit, it would be captured and reset. Um, and we prioritized for crawling of new domains because, well, there's a lot of spam. And this allowed us to map the technical resources needed, the web and the HTTP server. And there's a whole nice discussion in the paper, but the conclusion is don't bother with whack-a-mole. These resources are too diverse and too easily replaceable for interdiction on either the DNS or HTTP level or registration level to really work. So negative result. Don't bother with takedown of these hosting infrastructure. Then we started to cluster and tag. So the clustering was. Um, an automatic process, get things that look alike into clusters. And then tagging was a much more manual process where we'd examine the page contents in order to uh, come up with rules to re represent uh, actual infrastructure. And I did a lot of the tagging, um, tagging rule generation. Um, and uh, we tagged uh, basically 40% of the total volume coming in to identified affiliate programs. So for 40% of the spam, we could say not just that it's a spam for this uh, thing, but it, that it's for a specific affiliate program. So one of 30 businesses, basically. Although there may be some duplicates. We might double count count some affiliate program behind the scenes that looks different. So the textual clustering was initial similarity. And this is where we acted to exclude porn, gambling, and the other stuff we didn't care about um, until the porn filter was in place. Going through the tagged clusters was kind of uh, not pleasant. Um, and the clusters were manually validated. Tagging, however, was a manual process in terms of coming up with rules. So what we did is we ex and is examine the page source to create regular expressions to identify individual programs. How many remember the scene in the matrix where the guy is sitting in front of the computer with all the green stuff flowing down and he's going blonde, brunette, redhead? It gets like that where it was Eva, Eva, RX promotions, looking at the HTML. And the reason why, I'll get to in a sec, is that although many programs offer multiple storefronts or brands, how they are implemented demonstrates commonalities. And so if you see this same bonkers HTML motif, you know it's the same guy. Um, and it's because, well, people have quirks when they do things the first time. And then why re-engineer different sites when you can just change the CSS, change the logo pointer? It looks totally different. So an uh, example of things that were interesting that we discovered, Canadian Health and Care Mall. This is Eva Pharmacy. Other brands that they use include uh, US Drugs, I believe, and uh, CVS Pharmacy. They will send out spam as CVS Pharmacy, this particular outfit. If we actually look behind the scenes, there are some interesting HTML conventions. So you see these image tracker tags with these uh, what look like hash values GIF with what looked to be like a timer or a sequence number. Only Eva uses this convention. So if ever we see this, we know it's Eva. And this is very easy to write a regular expression for. So now we see all the Eva in our database. Um, this may suggest something about their hosting infrastructure. That this, their hosting infrastructure may be a caching front end and this 
basically acts as a cash bust so that they can get a good hit count on their back end. Um, another convention that they often but not always used is they cheaped out. They were unwilling to pay for hosting for all the images. So on all the images on the page, instead of actually hosting them on the same web server, they compromised a bunch of machines around the net, put up web servers on port 8080, and addressed them by IP address. <laughs> Bunkers! It made the pages load awful. It caused page loads to fail, images to fail loading. But it cut their bandwidth bill in half. And a large fraction use this convention. And even those that don't, we can still key in on the site template structure. So images, chcm, logo.gif, that's Canadian Health and Care Mall. If it's images, cvs, logo.gif, it's their CVS version. And these port 8080 systems were just compromised third-party web servers running an Nginx proxy cache to serve these images. Go out, compromise a few machines, and that was their image hosting infrastructure. When you're running a criminal ops op operation, you don't tend to care about the little niceties of, uh, of not hacking into people's systems. So approximately how many compromised machines did you see? Uh, we saw about uh, 40 or 50 total. Um, some of these had very short lifespans. Some of them were up for basically the whole length of the project. And that was for Eva alone? Eva alone is the only one that did this. Everybody else used direct image hosting. Were you able to coordinate with any? Like, do you, do you, did you have access to any of these web servers? It might have been. I'll get to that later. But now that we know the players, let's actually start purchasing. And this was the genius idea of Chris down in San Diego, was actually doing the infrastructure needed for purchasing. 120 purchases attempted, $80 median purchase price, 56 successful product shipped. The rest of them basically didn't go through. That it turns out, we found out, bad guys have a fraud problem. So as a result, they are amazingly selective about shipping stuff. We couldn't ship to random PO boxes or anything. We had to use our home addresses. So my address was not used except for once or twice to check for blacklisting, but I've gotten a package of, uh, of Zyrtec from India. So the affiliate programs provide the common infrastructure, including payment and fulfillment. So for us, we only purchased legal to us items. Over-the-counter drugs and herbals, because, well, over-the-counter, we're allowed to buy. Herbals, well, the FDA says herbal stuff is fair game until it's proven to kill you, and even then you've got six months before they do anything, so we could buy that. Um, the software bought was software that uh, we had licenses for, so UC's lawyers were happy down in San Diego. And uh, fake Rolexes, because we needed some luxury goods, and those got taken apart and quite entertainingly destroyed. Payment was tracked using special gift cards. That's not legal to buy fake Rolexes. You're violating copyright. I don't think Rolex is objecting to us putting the purveyors of fake Rolexes out of business. Okay. Um, it's the spirit of the law. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things is, is there's been a recent regulation with money laundering. Those gift cards you buy at the supermarket you can't use for international transactions. Inter any card for an international transaction must have a real human name and address associated with it to prevent la money laundering. But uh, we were able to get, um, Chris was able to do the legwork for this, to get corporate gift cards where we use the valid mailing address and create card numbers on demand. So we create a valid card with X dollars on it, with one of our names and one of our mailing addresses, and that's used for the purchase with that address so it passes all the fraud checks. Um, and then the guys down in San Diego have uh, a collection of burner phones because they'll try to phone verify purchases um, because they've got a fraud problem. One of the really brilliant things is the card agreement allowed us to see merchant information. Normally, your credit card statements for gift cards say nothing. 
Um, your credit card statement for your real credit card will have some information about the uh, merchant. But this allowed us to see full merchant bank and merchant ID information. So we could see what the merchant said the transaction was, what the, um, incidentally, they're honest. The pharmaceuticals are called pharmaceuticals. The, the software is called software. Um, but it also allowed us to see which banks were processing the credit cards. Um, now, why did they have a fraud problem? I mean, if the credit card or the gift card goes through, do they care if it's fraud? Uh, yes, they do, because suppose it's a, a purchase done with a stolen credit card. What happens is the legitimate owner calls up the bank, disputes the charge, the bank gets the money back, who gets the money back from the merchant bank, and it's the same charge back process. And chargebacks are death. Uh, you do not want too many chargebacks as a merchant. In fact, uh, I believe the UC Santa Barbara folks looked into the rogue AV systems. The rogue AV systems actually track their current chargeback rate. And if their current chargeback rate is low and they get a complaint, they just basically tell the person to go, go bleep themselves. If their current chargeback rate is high, they give an immediate refund. So that's why they have a fraud problem. So the order process, though, heavily interactive. Automatic emails with order numbers, quite legitimate looking email receipts. Email or phone verifications were quite common. Um, I think the folks down in San Diego had to answer the question from one of them, why are you ordering so much Zyrtec? And they made up a story about an allergic cat. And fulfillment is the interesting weak point. The products are hard to disrupt. Drop ship from foreign locations. So like the fake Rolexes were pretty much all from the same place, but that's really hard to stop. Um, the fake Rolexes on the inside had maker's mark of Jelena Shatinarand inside. The inside, if you take off the back, um, if you Google for this phrase, you find it going back at least five years. So it seems to have started out as Geneva, Switzerland, <laughs> in some Chinese maker's <laughs> messed up uh, typography. Um, and since then, somebody must have told them what it means. And they've seemingly kept this as a maker's mark. Because hey, whenever you take off the back of a fake Rolex like this, it's obvious. Um, the other real good way to tell a fake Rolex, look on the back side. Is there a hologram sticker? Rolex gave up on those hologram stickers years ago. The fakes still use them. The drugs were from India and elsewhere. Um, would you test the drugs, would you take them? <laughs> <laughs> the latter, no. The former, this is what we can say. One of the samples of Zyrtec was put through a GCMS, and the active ingredient was in the right dosage and the right active ingredient, but we have no clue on the inactive ingredients or anything else. But they are at least attempting to ship the advertised product. Didn't you feed it to the cat? <laughs> <laughs> I like my cats. But payment processing is the weak point. 95% of the test purchases during the initial study cleared through just three banks. And all three banks terminated all associated merchants' accounts in the face of bad publicity. However, bad publicity was Stefan getting in touch with Markovic at the New York Times. And it was an above-the-fold headline in section two of the business section detailing this work and that these banks were allowing spam and responded with quite no comments when asked. So um, when you get banks' attention, it, things happen. And during this, we got a rather crash course in dealing with publicity. Um, the rule was Stefan came up with a nice set of talking points that we'd use. For print, it was first contact through the New York Times and the like. Um, and then for things like local radio, local news, it was. How, how, the, how can a bank know this business actually is operated in this uh, underground? There's no way of knowing. 
Sort of. These are, there's some responsibility of the banks to know. And also, they are being kind of honest. And they're, they're slightly shady accounts. The chargeback rates are higher. They're saying pharmaceuticals. How many legitimate pharmaceutical businesses are going to be processing through the Merchant Bank of Azerbaijan to US customers? How many? Legit? None. Illegit? They stopped. Um, that's the thing, that this does become more precisely, this can be a reactionary mechanism. That creating a new merchant account takes uh, days to weeks for a spammer. Because merchant, creating merchants' accounts requires a lot of hand-holding. It's a manual process. They have to vet you because the bank has a lot at risk. It only takes us one purchase to find out who the merchant who the merchant's bank is. Were, you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Were these the only three banks that would take them on or like you said you cut them off. Do you think that they'll have good luck finding uh, they shifted very quickly and there are folks down in San Diego who are having fun with this right now. Um, so it's an arms race, but it's a arms race that is in our favor because um, if the banks choose to cooperate, it's one phone call to take them down and five days for them to get set up. So it's one of those cases where the asymmetries favor us. Is there some illegality that the bank is involved in implicitly? It may or may not be against their agreements. I do not know. That's kind of my question. So by your own admission, you bought stuff that was not illegal. So what's, what's illegal here? That 95% of their purchases that are being processed are illegal. People don't buy counterfeit Microsoft software when they have legitimate licenses unless they're testing. Um, people don't buy Zyrtec from online spamvertised pharmacies. They buy prescription drugs, which is illegal. Um, so you and, correlated your legal purchases to all yeah. sites that also sell illegal things. Yes, in fact, we only bought the legal stuff from illegal sites. Um, so your, um, your adversary could just stop doing this sort of thing that you're targeting and do the stuff that you can't actually go after. Well, the software we can pretty much always go after. Um, the pharmaceutical, uh, well, what we do is we talk to a friendly doctor and get the doctor to be the one doing the purchases so that they can be legal purchases. So that's that's the counter for that. But the porn, obviously, you... We aren't touching porn. We aren't bothering with porn. The other... Pro There's no way to know the percent that you're that you've targeted, that you're reaching. Um, yes, there is, because we, of the... This covered 30, 40% of all the spam we got was these 30 affiliate programs. Um, the... Uh, so anyway, that was kind of interesting. Got us lots of good publicity, lots of fun. But those order numbers were interesting. It's one of those classic vulnerabilities. Um, multiple affiliate programs used linearly increasing order numbers. This is a classic blunder dating back to World War II, at least. Um, so seven online pharmacies and three software vendors had order numbers that looked suspicious. So. The idea was keep buy. So purchase pairs of purchase to verify the sequential hypothesis test. Thus, this project was called purchase pair. Um, and then you do an interval purchase to estimate order volume. And that's it. And this resulted in another 150 plus purchase attempts. Um, and Kirill trolled GlavMed's affiliate support program because uh, they have affiliates posting order numbers. Hey, did this order go through? Did that order go through? So this allowed us to see further order numbers. And then all but Rx promotion used linear order numbers. There's a lot in the paper on the sequential validation of all this. Rx promotions increased theirs by two. So they have two bugs rather than one. <laughs> um, and the forum numbers for GlavMed match the purchase numbers for GlavMed. So this was some initial test purchases. 
Um, and this was our initial round of purchasing for the Oakland paper and then the additional round of purchases for the purchase pair paper. And everything is these lovely straight lines, which give you uh, order volume. And that's amazingly simple because this now allows us to estimate orders per day. So RX promotions, 455 orders per day. Pharmacy Express, 260. GlavMed, 582. Eurosoft, 750. 33 Drugs. Royal Software, Soft Sales. Online, Eva. Eva. Eva is the one to watch out for in the online pharmacy world. Um, RX Promotions and I think it's Pharmacy Express or Glav... I think it's RX Promotion and GlavMed. They're kind of involved in this uh, hack each other um, condition because the, the guys in charge of each used to be business partners and there was kind of a falling out and it's resulted in them hacking each other and spewing their databases across the internet for enterprising reporters to read. And um, Both of them had the brilliant idea of the Russian police are bribable, so each tried to bribe the Russian cops to go after the other guys. Unfortunately, it worked too well and the Russian cops are going after both of them. Eva doesn't have the wild parties or anything. They just are plugging along and selling a lot. Um, Eva also is able to do spam that's getting through Gmail spam filters. So now that we got an order rate, all we need is what can be called a scientific wild leap guess for revenue per order. Because gross revenue is orders times revenue per order, so we have guess one, Spamalytics, which was uh, this previous study done by colleagues at UCSD and, uh, and uh, ICSI, which is, well, how well do people respond to spam? Modify spam and see. So they created a fake pharmacy site and modified the spam that a real botnet was sending to go to their fake site instead and see what the conversion rates were. Guess two, just assume people always buy the cheapest, cheapest item in the storefront. And guess three is what we call basket inference. What is the distribution of items that users purchase? So all we have to do is find out what people buy, and that'll do it. So somebody asked previously about that silly little 8080 hosting bit. Well. Any given EVA visit used a set of five image hosters, and it was always five, and it was always an image, if you visited multiple pages, was always from the same image hoster. And this seemed to rotate and go screwy, but um, it sort of seemed to original, randomly select which image was matched to which end, back end hoster it was using for a particular visitor. Um, but these were interesting, the back-end systems. We attempted to contact the site owners of basically all the systems of any significant volume with almost no success. I sent out a lot of emails that got nothing back. What but did they ask? Yeah. What? What did they ask? You have a compromised system at blah, blah, blah. Uh, we are looking for information on this, stuff like that. So. <laughs> Could be. A lot of these also might not have been uh, to English speakers. A lot of the sites were uh, Chinese and Asian countries. Uh, but some of them I expected a response, like one of them was the test site for a conference's web page. So it wasn't the conference's web page, it was their previously set up test site, and I tried contacting the program committee chairs. Nothing. Um, one was a VM which was a company in Texas. They shut it down, gave us the VM image, but we we're unable to find a binary, probably because I'm not good at for forensics. I should have handed it to you guys. Um, and one was at a university where we have colleagues on the IDS team. This uh, university runs the Bro IDS, and like all good Bro users, they are unapologetic data pack rats. They record everything. And we got it. They were able to give us both 
NetFlow and the HTTP log for five days from the system when it was compromised. In fact, they were quite happy to find out because this was some departmental computer that got cleaned up without notifying central security. This included every HTTP request, the item requested, the IP address, and the referrer field. So we know what page they were visiting that the image was on that was loaded. And this allowed us to basically get an analytics view into an online pharmacy. So the user visits the landing page. It has a bunch of images on it. It gets it from these five image hosters, one of which is us. So everybody who visits, we see. Now when they click to add something to visit the shopping flow, for the site is you can't just click into the shopping cart from the front page. You click on something that gives you the product page. And the URL on the product page tells it what it is. And the product page has some more images. So if they view a product, we are liable to see it because it's liable to have a new image that goes to our image hoster. If they then click Add to Cart, it goes to the shopping cart page that, again, has new images because there's the, all the little recommended stuff on it. And then if they go to checkout, it goes to a SSL site that we can't see. So this gives us a almost complete analytics view. It gives us who visits, what page they're visiting, what product they are viewing, what product is added to the shopping cart. Um, and we suspect that this only includes the spammed EVA pharmacies, not the SEO'd EVA pharmacies, because we've been, some of the folks down at San Diego have been looking at SEO and they haven't seen any of the 8080 hosting on search engine optimized pharmacies, where what they're doing is they're basically Google bombing for keywords to drive traffic to their site. But, 45 of the top 50 domains that we see were in our spam feeds. So this is very much the analytics for a spam advertised online pharmacy. So who visits? Well, visitors everywhere. You got to have your, uh, your GOIP located graph. What? In the Falklands? Like seriously? That's where GEO located too. Military people? <laughs> It could be an error. You never trust GOIP completely. It's only a good rough guess, especially when you're using the city light database. But who shops is much more what we expect. Hmm. Looks like Americans are doing a lot of the purchasing. Um, so these are people who added something to the shopping cart. Some in Canada, a lot in Europe, little in Australia. Little, little elsewhere. But it's basically the major industrialized countries, and the biggest one is the US. The US is a huge fraction of the market. So 91% of the shoppers are Western countries. 75% is the United States. So if we could get the US citizens to stop buying spamvertised products, it would work. Or if we could get the US banks to not do pharmacy card not present transactions to Azerbaijan for pharmaceuticals, same diff. So the question is, what do people buy? Well, one of the nice things is EVA categorizes everything for us. These are EVA's own categories of products. Men's health, there's a couple legitimate pharmaceuticals in there, but you know what's in there. Pain relief. Soma, tramadol. Women's health is a mixed bag. Half of it's abuse stuff, recreational, female pink Viagra, garbage like that. But some of it's truly legit stuff. General health, legit, antibiotics, antidepressants, weight loss. All the rest of this stuff is pretty much truly legit products that people are buying. Um, and the interesting thing is we, what we did is we classed things into lifestyle which are things that are not medically indicated by most of the buyers. So Viagra et al. Basically, men's health and some of women's health. Um, the interesting thing is, here they have a huge cost advantage. They are selling it cheap. That's why it sells. 
um, Soma and Tramadol. Eva does sell Soma and Tramadol, which are uh, Schedule two or three, I think, depending on the state. Um, so it's being bought for abuse purposes. Um, human growth hormone is not being bought because people are midgets. Um, but the other remarkable thing was the large amount of legitimate drugs. Antibiotics, cholesterol medication, heart medication, cancer meds, you name it. They have a formulary 150 plus and it gets used. Um, and this we call the social commentary section of our paper. There's a big difference if you compare populations. In Europe and Canada, 92% of the purchases are lifestyle. So not only are they less aggressive purchasers, but most of what they purchase is just for recreational usage. U.S., it's only two-thirds lifestyle. One-third of U.S. purchases, or at least cart ads, we assume that cart ad equals purchase proportionally, are legitimate stuff, antibiotics, cholesterol, all this long tail. So since the U.S.'s bulk of their business, this says that a good 25 plus percent of their business is this long tail of other stuff. Um, and we suspect, just as a guess, that it's the availability of prescriptions that's the gating factor, not the cost of the drugs themselves. Because we did not do a detailed survey on cost, but amoxicillin was one of the most popular, legit things. Amoxicillin from Eva is way more expensive than amoxicillin from Walmart. Um, and I suspect the reason why is if you don't have insurance, getting a prescription is 100 bucks, even if the drug is only 10 bucks at Walmart. So it's still cost. Yes, but it is cost of medical access, not cost of the pharmaceutical itself. But the other thing is, is this long tail matters for the business. This is a good hunk of their revenue. But now it's just multiplication. You take your given, um, your given guest per order, that gives you the given revenue per month. Take minimum price per order or the basket weighted average. For software, uh, the folks down at San Diego crawled the torrent sites and used that to develop the basket. Um, but the important takeaway is spamming's a small business. It's on the order of $100 million a year, maybe $200 million a year gross revenue worldwide for the entire industry for pharmaceutical and software. That's a pretty pathetically small business. But it doesn't take all that much of a business when it's just a few small players. If you're only dealing with 10, 20, maybe 30 players, and the players are happy with uh, a couple million dollars to ten million dollars a year. That's all it takes. Um, what about profit? Um, profit has to be less. We don't know what the profit is. Um, it's obviously less, but if their overheads are small, maybe it is a high margin business. They don't have much revenue in order to make it a worthwhile endeavor. Um, I suspect that it's fairly high margin for the spammers because they're getting 50, 60 percent of the revenue and their cost is the cost of spam. I think for the affiliate program it's probably less because they actually have to do the merchant accounts. The merchant account bank alone is a couple of percent to who knows what percent. Um, the uh, order fulfillment, all that costs money. So um, it's not a huge business. It's enough for a few people to make really good living at, but it's not this billion dollar, ten billion dollar a year business that we see claimed. It's it's relatively small for reference. Um, Which is what we spend to prevent spam. Yes, we spend orders of magnitude more stopping spam than spam is worth. So how do you characterize the damage done? Oh, orders of magnitude. This is the textbook example of externalities in action. We spend billions fighting it alone, plus the cost of the compromise systems, plus all these other 
costs associated with spam. Um, and um, but as the spammers don't pay the cost, they're quite happy to do it. Um, and orders per month, does it account for the anti-fraud stuff, the, the monotonic number you have? Um, no, actually, it could. It's so a overestimate. Over yes, the orders per month is an upper bound. The revenue estimates are kind of a lower bound to mid bound, so it's it's a fuzzy number. Uh, it could be two hundred million, it could be fifty million, but it's in that ballpark. Oh, you had a question. Okay. So, but overall, this is a great example of externalities. So the obligatory conclusion. It is actually possible to understand the economic and technical infrastructure used by spam. It was a lot of work of a team of 15. Um, it is possible to disrupt key components. Um, the financial processing is a weak point. Uh, it does require continual monitoring and response, but it at least appears plausible. And the business is relatively small which is probably a good thing, which it means there aren't that many actors involved, which means knocking down their revenue um, or their uh, merchant accounts when you're only dealing with 20 opponents, it's a lot easier than if we we're dealing with 200 or 2,000. But because the total revenue pool is so small, there can't be all that many players and still make money at it. So. Questions? Comments? What if you stopped spending all that money protecting us from spam? Um, have you looked at what your Gmail spam box looks like? And remember, that is actually after Google drops a lot of the stuff just on the floor. That unfortunately, if you don't have the anti spam measures, your signal to noise on email goes to uselessness. The number is uh, 100 million. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too small. You divide each order by 100. Then you are, are you saying 1 million users over a year period globally yeah. actually buy? That sounds like small. Yeah, it's it's small, and there's uh, some okay. other revenue or there's some other database sources that Krebs has analyzed that give similar answers. I mean, 30,000 a day yeah. across the globe. Yeah. Hmm. How many people do you know have actually bought something from an online pharmacy that got spammed to them? My wife did. <laughs> <laughs> and they did it once, right? <laughs> it was my cat. <laughs> When you think about the population, I think 30,000 a day is very too low. I mean, this, um, think about it, like uh, the fishing attack in our, our campus. Um, we can never eliminate fishing attack on, at MPS. No, that's very different than when we looked at. But it's yeah. similar. People like to click things. No, like, people don't on spam. The, the spam analytics paper shows the really lousy conversion rate that spam gets. That's too lousy. That's like 30,000 a day across the globe. Um, as I said, there's uh, some data that Krebs, I think Krebs has posted that um, database stuff that suggests similar. There, there's, there's other data sources that I know of that concur on this rough estimate of order volume. Because these are the big players. We've identified the big players based on volume going in through spam. So. And as I said, a couple of them have gotten into fighting matches where they've dumped their uh, databases. GlavMed has published their order numbers in their forum. So these are affiliates posting order numbers. So either they went out of their way to fake affiliate forums to fool researchers into really thinking that their market is small, or that's the number of orders they're actually generating. That, that the order rate is estimated by both our test purchases and the GlavMed forum postings. That, that those are 
postings of order numbers that are nicely linearly increasing at a rate that says GlavMed is, uh, what is GlavMed? GlavMed is 580 orders a day. And this is um, not an order rate not just based on our test purchases, but based on the traffic in GlavMed's own forum. Did you notice any effect? So if you follow the link on uh, email, does that account pull more spam? Are they uh, whitelisting sucker emails? Uh, we don't really know, so we can't we aren't able to tell on that. We are able to tell, though, on some of the EVA stuff. Uh, EVA is notorious for, among other things, they've been known to compromise Yahoo Mail accounts and Hotmail accounts, I think, um, and send mail to all the people in the user's address book as the user whose account's compromised. And uh, we actually see a couple of those campaigns, the AAsia, BAsia campaign, those spams get through spam filters, but seem to have a much lower conversion rate. So getting somebody to read the spam message doesn't necessarily result in a sale. Um, what are you guys going to do next? Um, we've got a whole bunch of things. So um, there's the continual monitoring and crawling is an ongoing thing. Um, I'm working on little plug computers that we can put in all our houses so that we can have non-blacklistable crawl points so that if the bad guys start blacklisting us, we're able to do test crawls from people's arbitrary home addresses. So either we there are IP addresses that aren't being aggressively used, aren't tied to us in any way. And hell, if they get blast blacklisted, I'm sure Comcast would love to be blacklisted by the bad guys. So, um, so that's one of the other things. Um, continuing to investigate a lot of stuff in this area. Um, continually monitoring how they switch banks. There's a lot of stuff that's going on. Just now, you said the banks were sensitive to this. They didn't want to continue operating if they were not participating. Now, these banks are in this foreign country. Why do they care? Um, because international reputation matters in the visa system. Um, also, I don't know. I have no way of telling. This is just rank speculation of my own. I think there is a difference between Visa and MasterCard in this front because a lot of these spam sites will take Visa, but not take MasterCard. Um, and this is very unusual, because how many places do you know of that aren't being bought and paid for by Visa or MasterCard don't take both? So there is some difference in the system between Visa and MasterCard. So reputation matters for this. Um, that's why I said uh, a. Uh, a Section B1 article in the New York Times gets the bank's attention, but a reporter calling does not. They no commented Markovic uh, when he was calling, um, but they responded very rapidly when it got published. Did you consider getting any more insights by actually signing up as an affiliate? You know, um, no, no not comment. Doing anything illegal, but like actually under you know, per Zach's point of understanding the, the profit margins and stuff like this. Is there any insight to be had? No comment. Future paper. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> also, have you talked to law enforcement? They, they may have some. Uh, the, undercover the, the San Diego folks handle that point of contact. Oh, and also in the acknowledgments, I forgot to include, down at UC San Diego, they have a really good lawyer. Karen? Yeah. Um, and also that they were able to get the uh, dean to approve of this. All right, so let's thank the speaker. If you have more questions for me,